Hi, this is Sarah at the Guelph Turf Grass Institute, and let's talk turf. So, back in the day when I was doing my Bachelor of Science here at the University of Guelph, I was given the opportunity to work as an assistant in a lab. So I applied for and was awarded what we call an undergraduate student research award. So I worked in Dr. Tom Shung's lab and I helped a PhD student do their research. And so the student I worked with, her name is Linda Jewell, now Dr. Jewell, because she finished her PhD. And she was working on Microdochium nivale. That's a fungus that causes pink snow mold and we also have called it Fusarium patch. Now we call it Microdochium patch on turf grasses. So we still are in touch and we call ourselves the Microdochium sisters. <laughs> so today I'm gonna read Linda's abstract from her PhD thesis. And then I'm gonna try to break it down so that we can understand it. So the title is Genetic and Pathogenic Differences Between Microdochium nivale and Microdochium magus. So let's figure that out. Genetic and pathogenic differences. So genetic differences, that kind of makes sense to me. That's, you know, differences in the DNA. But pathogenic differences, that means is one individual or one species more able to cause disease than the other? Is one a better pathogen than the other? That's a pathogenic difference. And so we're looking at the difference between Microdochium nivale and Microdochium magus. So they're two species that are different, but they're the same genus. So it's genus species, Microdochium is genus, nivale is species. So they're the same, in the same group. They're basically like two leaves on the same branch of a tree of life. Okay, so let's read the abstract. Microdochium nivale and M. magus are fungal plant pathogens that cause cool temperature diseases on grasses and cereals. Nucleotide sequences of four genetic regions were compared between isolates of M. nivale and M. magus from Triticum aestivum wheat collected from North America and Europe and for isolates of M. nivale from turf grasses from both continents. Draft genome sequences were assembled for two isolates of M. magus and two of M. nivale from wheat and one from turf grass. Dendograms constructed from these data resolved isolates of M. magus into separate clades by geographic origin. Among M. nivale, isolates were instead resolved by host plant species. Amplification of repetitive regions of DNA from M. nivale isolates collected from two proximate locations across three years grouped isolates by year rather than by location. The mating type, MAT1, and associated flanking genes of Microdochium were identified using the genome sequencing data to investigate the potential for these pathogens to produce ascospores. In all of the Microdochium genomes and in isolates assessed by PCR, only the MAT1-2-1 gene was identified. However, unpaired, single conidium-derived colonies of M. magus produced fertile parathesia in the lab. This finding contrasts with the canonical requirements for sexual spore production among the Ascomycota. To further explore this, MAT1 and flanking gene sequences were identified in the genome sequences of six additional species from Xylariaceae. No homologues of known MAT1-1-1 genes were detected, suggesting that the control of sexual reproduction among Xylariaceae may be differentially regulated relative to other Sordariomycete species. Detached leaves of T. aestivum and Poa pertensis, Kentucky bluegrass, were inoculated with either M. nivale or M. magus and were incubated at either 23 degrees Celsius or at 4 degrees Celsius to investigate the infection processes of these pathogens. Despite reported field host preferences, the two pathogens were equally virulent on both host plants at the temperatures investigated. The results presented here reveal genetic but not pathogenic differences between M. nivale and M. magus and further demonstrates that subpopulations may exist within the groups of these pathogens on different host plants. Okay, Linda, calm down with the big words. <laughs> Let's try to break that down. So we're talking about two species as we talked about, Microdochium nivale and Microdochium nivale. Microdochium nivale and Microdochium magus. For, you know, to make it shorter, Microdochium gets shortened to M period. So that's just a short form. 
So we know that they're both pathogens on grasses and cereals. When we're talking about cereals, that's, you know, wheat, oat, those kind of grasses that we eat. <laughs> Nucleotide sequences, we're talking about DNA of four genetic regions. So four different spots on the DNA sequence. So maybe if you imagine all the chromosomes, just pick four different spots on the different chromosomes. And we compared them between the two species on wheat. Um, so we're looking at isolates. And when I say isolates, that means that we took infected plant tissue and we cultured the pathogen out of it. We isolated it from the plant tissue. So we isolated the two species from wheat and we also isolated the two species from turf grasses from North America and Europe. So we've got sort of four different populations, either wheat in North America, wheat in Europe, turf grass in North America, turf grass in Europe for the two species. Draft genome sequences were assembled for two isolates. So that means when we sequence DNA, that means that we figure out the exact pattern of the entire genome. So if we were looking previously at four little genetic regions, that would be like picking out four books from a library. But if, in this, we're looking at reading the entire library worth of books. They did it for two isolates of magus and two isolates from the valley, from wheat and one from turf grass, so that we can see the difference between the two species and the two hosts. Then we made a dendrogram, and a dendrogram is sort of like, I, I will think of it as like the tree of life. It's what you think of when you're thinking about um, evolution and you see the branches coming off. Um, it's a mathematical process of sorting things based on how similar they are to each other. So if things are closer to each other on the branch of the dendrogram, that means they're more closely related and their DNA is more similar. If they're totally branched off in a totally different direction and their branch is much further back, then they're not as related. So when they made this dendrogram, this big tree, with the information from the Microdokium magus species, it was able to sort the information by geographic region. So it was able to tell these are the isolates that came from North America and these are the ones that came from Europe. So that's kind of interesting. That means that there's a different population. There's genetic differences between those here in North America and those in Europe for Microdokium magus. When they looked at the data for Microdokium in a valley, they actually were able to tell if it was isolated from oat or turf grass. So that's interesting to say that's an actual, they've actually evolved more towards their host. So there's genetic differences between those that have infected oats, or sorry, wheat, and the others that have infected grass. Another interesting thing that they found was that they had some Microdokium valley isolates that were pretty close to each other. They were isolated from the same sort of area, but they were isolated from three different years. They actually were sorted on the tree by year rather than location. So there was genetic change over year. So for instance, if I were to go out and sample here at the Turf Grass Institute and then over at Cutton Fields and then over at Victoria Park, the golf course is nearby, all of those collected this year they would be pretty similar to each other. But if I were to collect from the same locations next year, again from Turf Grass Institute, Cotton Fields, and Victoria Park, the isolates, the DNA might be different from 2021 and 2022. So that means that the population is still changing over time, which is really cool. Now, fungi are a little bit weird. <laughs> They don't have genders uh, in the same way that we think of animals with male and female and um, XY chromosomes, XX chromosomes, sexual reproduction, you know, two different types need to combine to make offspring. They're similar though 
in that they have specific genes called mating genes. There's MAT1 and MAT2. Instead of male, female, one and two. Because we're really creative, you know? So fungi, they can do two types of reproduction. They could do sexual reproduction in that they have to find the MAT1 and MAT2 genes, get together, have some fun, make some babies. But they can also do asexual reproduction. And that would be just like, you know, I'm feeling very motherly and I would like to have some offspring. Yeah. Here are some more offspring that are genetically similar to me. And I don't need anyone else and then spread those babies. So that is asexual reproduction. So Microdarchium navali, we've seen canidia. Um, we've seen the asexual reproduction a lot, but we don't really see the sexual reproduction very much and we're not really sure why. It's been observed, but it's really rare. So Linda was trying to figure out why that is on a genetic level. So when she looked at the DNA of both of the Microdochium species, she found only one of the MAT genes, only one of the mating genes. However, when she took two of the asexual spores, so two individuals, put them in a petri dish, grew them together, they reproduced sexually. That's strange because she thought they only had one of the mating genes needed. So it produced what we call fertile parathesia. It's like the womb for babies. It's the, it's the sexual reproduction body. That was an interesting finding. And she says that this goes against what we know about Ascomycota, that whole group of fungi. We think that they need the two mating genes, but she only found one of them. So to further investigate that, she looked at the mating gene that she found and flanking sequences. So that's on either side of it along the train track of DNA. So she looked at it in related species to um, Microdochium navali and, and magus, and she didn't find the other mating gene in any of those either. So she says that mating in general must be different compared to other species in Ascomycota. Um, then she took detached leaves of wheat and Kentucky bluegrass and inoculated, so we added um, Microdochium navali or Microdochium mages. Inoculation is just the process of infecting it with the pathogen, essentially. So we took leaves in a petri dish, added the pathogen, and kept them at either 23 degrees or 4 degrees Celsius to allow the infection to happen. And she watched the infection process, saw how fast a lesion would form. So well, although Microdochium navali is more prevalent in the field, it's more frequently found as the pathogen causing pink snow mold or Microdochium patch, Microdochium magus is considered to be a weak pathogen. Although that that's what's seen in the field, she found that in the petri dish with those detached leaves, they were the same. So it seems that it's not their inherent ability to infect that's causing the differences. It might be something else in that maybe a living plant instead of a detached leaf would be able to fight off Microdochium magus. Maybe it has to do with competition against other pathogens or other microbes in the outdoor environment, maybe. We don't know. Overall, her research, there's different subpopulations of smaller populations of the pathogen in Europe and in North America and just even within wheat and turf grass. These little findings lead to future management recommendations and more understanding of the science in general. Now Linda runs her own lab and gets to do all sorts of plant pathology related investigations. So I'll be talking with Dr. Jewel later. I hope you enjoyed this and have a great day.